take a piece of paper and write down on it briefly three things that happen in Houston at night. Just list three things that happen at Houston at night. Because there's a reason for doing it we're going to discuss today. Poetry of people who are essentially interested in Georgic writing. That is, they're going to let us know about the occupations of England and the ways people occupy their time during the night and sometimes during the day. We're going to look at the works of John Gay, a writer of pastorals and probably the most famous English play of the 18th century, The Beggar's Opera. We're going to look at the poetry of Stephen Duck, who is a thresher poet. He was a laborer, and he learned enough to write poetry. Laborers in the 18th century in Scotland and England did have libraries. We're going to look at Mary Collier, who answers Stephen Duck's work with her own image of a washing woman. And then we're going to look at a prose treatise by Eliza Hayward, who... I'm sorry, Eliza Haywood, who gives an experience of a wo woman who chose to first make love to and then victimize a young man who ultimately turns out to have victimized her. So when you begin writing about what you've seen at night, uh, Mr. Barr, what did you write? What, what do we see at night? Press the button so we can hear you. People will go to sleep at night. <laughs> All right, those who aren't working in the hospitals as nurses and doctors, right. Some who sleep at night. Uh, Mr. Clary? Um, you see people like going out to the clubs and stuff? All right, clubs, and occasionally we see them getting beaten up and shot at those clubs, too. This is Houston. This is not a small town. Uh, Miss Close? I said crime. Pardon me? Crime. Crime. These specific types of crimes? Name, name some, I mean, we have to be specific. We can't just say crime exists rampant. They have to be specifics and they have to have some in specific places. Robbery. All right. Robbery, stabbings, killings, right? Miss Crockett. I said crazy people come out at night. Crazy people come out at night. <laughs> the eccentrics. Eccentrics. Yeah. So what do they do at night, these eccentrics? They howl at the moon? No, they just like talk to themselves or they tend to harass Talk people. to themselves. <laughs> right? They live under bridges. No, not just like, that's like saying every homeless person is a crazy. Like. <laughs> People who are like just not all there, you know, the freaks come out at night. It's a saying. Well, a lot of people living under bridges are schizophrenic. We know that, right? Not at all. Wow. Uh, Mr. Dickerson, at night, press the button. Uh, I put down. Um, that's when the uh, Chronicle is made and delivered. You can drive downtown and see the the mills kind of churning out all the newsprint. All right, so uh, you can have delivery men, milkmen, coal men at one time used to deliver early in the mornings, late at night, right before the before sundown, uh, before sunset. Excuse me, what am I saying? Before sun up. Okay, right during the night. Mr. Hallmark, not here yet. Mr. Harper, night. So that's when the street musicians come out and play on the street. All right. Mr. Hayes, street musicians. Mr. Hayes. Miss Lay. 
I said fine art events like ballet and musical shows take place at night. Plays, ballet, musical shows. And Mr. Harper was talking about street musicians standing by the railroad or a standing by subways, but not in Houston. No subways in Houston. Miss Luck. People go to bars or go drinking, I guess. Right. Yeah. We already have someone mention imbibing, enjoying themselves. Ice houses, right? They visit ice houses in Houston. Most people don't know what ice houses are. Uh, Miss Moon. Yeah. Um, I put athletic events like professional, college, high school. There's baseball and football and different kinds of sports being played at night. Right. And if you're on a softball team, sometimes you'll play four games in a day going into the night as the tournaments run on over the weekend. Miss Mortimer. Stores close and restock for the night. Stores closing and restocking, and some of them being raided at night, I suppose. Miss Palkin. Miss Palkin, yes. Press the button. We can't hear you without the button. Well, move to a table where there is one, or we want to hear your voice because everyone's important. I wrote that the street sweepers come out and clean parking lots and streets and freeway shoulders, things like that. Street sweepers, good. All right, we're building up a <coughs> list of information. We're building up a corpus of night events. Uh, Mr. Peters? I would have to say that the, OA, the 59 freeway will finally be free of traffic. <laughs> but since it uh, wouldn't do that, there will probably be racers out. Drag racers, you know, any, any place that they want to go really fast. Uh, right. Drag racers along Richmond Avenue as well as 59, right? And occasionally there are people in 59 who will climb on top of their trucks and paint on the streets, on, on the highway signs, right? We've got painters who make it their mark and their pride that they can get away with it. Uh, Miss Few. Mr. Steinberg. Reading. Reading. Reading <coughs> tomorrow night at 7.30. You can go to the Browser's Bookstore and probably hear poets from the University of Houston reading, right? Uh, Mr. Stubbs. I put um, Stubbs. bar hopping, but it's already been said. And also I put um, police officers laying in wait for speeders and drag racers. Those guys are annoying. So. All right, police officers are laying in wait. What else are the police after in the night in Houston? Any other suggestions? Innocent kids. <laughs> I'm not going to implicate the police in illicit <laughs> activity. Yes. <laughs> People with drugs, right? And they sell drugs in the drugstore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Taft. I would have to say uh, spin doctors for various state agencies and political candidates are working overtime to try and fix the gaffes that the, their people do make on, for that day. All right. Ms. Troxell. Ms. Vasquez. Ms. Venta. Oh, good. What, the hell, what happens at Houston at night? You mean the humid, humidity just extends itself, right? Yeah. But it can rain, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the rain gets so deep you can't even move your car through the water. Yeah, it's more likely to flood at night. More likely to flood at night. All right. 
and the other types of crimes that occur in Houston at night. We have people selling crack, what? People smuggling, right? Right. And of course, in any city and in Houston, prostitution as well. Well, if you're a poet and you're trying to document everything that happens at night, then you might do to, well to emulate John Gay. Now, we're going to look at John Gay's writing in just a few moments and see what he says. John Gay was a poet who wrote from 1685 to 1732. He wrote a poem called Wine, another called The Fan, in imitation of the Rape of the Lock. He wrote The Shepherd's Week, which was a series of pastoral poems imitating Spencer's Shepherd's Calendar, but in a satirical way. We're going to look today at trivia, or the art of walking the streets of London. And if you want to leave this class and write a, an essay on the art of walking the streets of Houston, you will have benefited from his paradigm. He also wrote plays. He wrote a play called Three Hours After Marriage with Alexander Pope and John Arbuthnot. He wrote The Beggar's Opera, which was the longest playing opera in history in its time, and a sequence poly. If you've never seen The Beggar's Opera, go to our music school and ask for the cassette tape and spend two and a half hours watching a unique play from the 18th century, which later became in America, in, in Germany, Kurt Weill's The Three Penny Opera. John Gay is also a member of the Scriblerus Club. I had mentioned to you that there were five writers who met together for the purpose of attacking the parliament of Robert Walpole, the prime minister. And John Gay joined Alexander Pope, John Arbuthnot, Parnell, and Jonathan Swift as members of the Scriblerus Club who were on the attack against the prime minister of England. But trivia was written long before Walpole became prime minister. It was written in 1716, I guess not long before, four years before. And if you look, we only have in our text book three, Walking the Streets by Night. Now, I'm going to just run through this list, and then I'm going to go, go back over it. But it'll give you some idea of the range of activities that you find First of all, he opens with a, an apostrophe to the goddess Trivia. Now, Trivia simply means trivial things. No one's going to take this really serious, seriously, but we do have a goddess by the name of Trivia. Then we're going to see teamsters on the road. These are people delivering goods, colliers, people delivering coal, and delivering wheat and crops. We're going to see criminals at night. And we're going to see John Gay warn us about pickpockets. If you go to the theater, if you go various places, watch out that someone's not going to take your money from you. We're going to find crowded streets. And one of the annoying elements on a crowded street is a distracted lover who sees a woman whom he admires and bumps into other people because he's unconscious of others walking by the street. Those are in lines 101 to 110. We're going to see that it's possible to sneak, instead of going by streets, going by alleyways, lines 127 to 132. And there are dangerous streets. The poet says, I wish we could have a safe community like they used to have in the past. But there was no safe community in the past, and the idea of people keeping the doors unlocked is pretty much a myth, although there may be some small towns and some neighborhoods where it once happened. There are dangerous coachmen. Watch out where you're driving. <clears throat> in Houston, I think it's very b a, a problem if you turn on your turn signal to indicate you're going right because the cars in your right will make sure you can't get into the lane. 
So you have drivers who will harass you, who will slow down in front of you if they know you're in a hurry. And you have crazy stagecoach drivers, people who drive wildly, people who get angry at others. There was road rage in the 18th century as there is road rage in the 20th century, but these were with stagecoaches. You're going to see oysters, women selling oysters at lines 185 to 194. And so it's a good idea sometimes to just pause and have an oyster meal with your soup. Lines 195 to 204. You can get caught in a rainstorm. And the rainstorm at night is messy. The mud is messy because you don't have paved streets. And uh, by the time you get indoors, you're absolutely soaked. You'll see men at a crossroad. Three men come to a crossroad and they won't let each other pass. So they have to pull their swords and by sword fighting they will determine who gets past. It's like being in Houston at a four-way stop sign. Uh, you're, according to the traffic code, you're always supposed to let the person to your right go first. At least, at least I think that's what I learned when I had to take that driving course again. Uh, but if you get four cars at a crossroad and some are in a hurry and are unwilling to stop and some are stopping and being courteous and they, they, all, they can get angry with each other. You'll, you'll generally see a funeral procession which gives the writer an opportunity to stop and contemplate about the real meaning of life and death. It's the major elegiac theme in this work. Lines 236 to 246, you're going to see how he uses the senses to make life understandable or comprehensible. There are dangers of the city, lines 248 to 258, which you will encounter. And among the dangers of the city are prostitutes. You see them at lines 259 to 266. Then you see it extended, prostitutes at work. And each of these, by the way, is a separate paragraph. And, and uh, you'll understand paragraphing if you follow John Gay. And then you realize that a man who has sold his sheep with a wad of money in his pocket goes to bed with a prostitute only to wake up in the morning to find out that she is gone. And so is his money. About a hard lesson to learn. A harder lesson is when... Several weeks later, he discovers he has contracted venereal disease from her. You may find yourself involved in an altercation, just walking down the street and accidentally you get involved with other people and you're arrested along with them. You can prove your innocence, but it may be easier to get out of jail by giving the watchman a bribe. And finally, or perhaps not funny. There are street gangs in London. Yeah, we have more. There are street gangs in London in the 18th century. Uh, you'll get to meet the names of a few of them. Street gangs are nothing new. The 18th century had them. And the gangs used to occasionally catch a watchman, knock him out, put him in a barrel, and roll him down London Hill where he would crash into a lamp post. Good fun for the street gangs. The streets sometimes are too dark. You can't move about. It's dangerous. It's also dangerous driving at night. At night, you're also going to find fires occurring. You'll hear the fire engines rushing to put out fires and, in many cases, arriving too late. You'll see fire and you'll see the destruction of these houses. But what is this business of walking at night? The business is learning what life is about and learning how life extends itself. Learning by experience is the basic thesis of Gay's trivia. The poet ends by explaining to the reader what he has hoped the reader has learned. And then the writer plays a tribute to himself 
in talking about how what he writes. Others may read years from now as Shakespeare has written in his sonnets. I don't think it's unusual to discover that most of the evening events you described, Gay has put into poetry 200, 300 years earlier because people's personalities don't change. Now what I'd like to do is look at some of the, these subjects for a few moments and then we'll move on. If you look in your text to page 681 of Walking the Streets by Night. Now first of all the poem is in iambic pentameter couplets the same as Alexander Pope's Rape of the Lock. O trivia goddess, leave these low abodes and traverse o'er the wide ethereal roads. Celestial queen, put on thy robes of light. Now Cynthia named, fair regent of the night. Cynthia, of course, is the goddess who represents night, who represents childbirth as well, because the events that happen at night often lead to childbirth in the next day. Now one of the activities that you engage in when you're writing in our English department is the this, this discovery of the paragraph. How do you write a paragraph? A paragraph is a unified thesis. You say everything you want to say in a paragraph by giving us a topic sentence by giving us illustrative details, and by summarizing. Sometimes it's like shifting gears. When you're ready to move into another subject, you shift gears. I notice a phenomena in the uh, exam questions that you provided me that there are almost no paragraphs. I don't know whether the computer didn't allow you to paragraph. It didn't let you paragraph, so I had to discover the paragraphs myself. I didn't penalize you because of it simply because it was obvious that something was happening with the computer and you could not indent. But paragraphing is the essence of writing because in a paragraph you're going to give us your major thesis. Whenever you write paragraphs, as you well know, we do not want one and two sentence paragraphs. They don't mean anything. Although trivia does have a two sentence paragraph. Uh, what we want is the development of an idea. And so each of these topics I've just named to you is a separate idea paragraphed, and each idea has its own thesis. <clears throat> so we find out that when the first stars appear, what's happening? This is on page 681, round line 9. When night first bids the twinkling stars appear, or with her cloudy vest enwraps the air, then swarms the busy street. Now we have a caesura, a pause in the iambic pentameter. With caution tread. Let's be careful now, it's nighttime. Where the shop windows falling threaten thy head. And the display windows are being closed. And if you walk under them when the shop owner's closing his windows, you can get smacked on the head. Now laborers home return and join their strength to bear the tottering plank or ladder's length. So they take down the ladders, put them on their shoulders, and start moving. And if you're walking in the way, you can get slammed in the head with a ladder end, the foot of a ladder. Still fix thy eyes intent upon the throng, and as the passes open, wind along. All right, so you're going to be very careful, and you're going to wait for the opportunity to move through the crowds and go through. Now, I don't know whether Houston is in a, a, a city where people are often walking on the sidewalks, like New York, like London, like Las Vegas where well, you have to kind of edge your way through the crowds in holiday seasons. 
So what you have is a warning. Let's start walking, but be careful where you walk. Now he starts talking about where you're going to walk. And he identifies various buildings. If you were going to write trivia or walking the campus at night, you would go past the Hoffman Hall and you would move toward the College of Technology. You would go to the College of Architecture. You might go by the walking men statue. Where the fair columns of St. Clement stand, who straighten bounds encroach upon the strand. So you're moving along the strand. Where the low penthouse bows the walker's head. Sometimes you've got low bellies, you've got to bend down. <clears throat> and the rough pavement wounds the yielding tread. Where not a post protects the narrow space. And strong entwines, combs dangle in thy face. Women in front of you wearing combs in their hair. If the combs have fallen out, you're, you're facing these combs. This is getting very, very specific. Very detailed. Extremely animated. And the fact that you get this, this tapestry being woven in poetry becomes a, a monumental picture. Let's hear about the street singers that Mr. Harper mentioned earlier. Go to line 78. Let not the ballad singer's shrilling strain amid thy, the swarm thy listening ear detain. You're going to stop and you're going to want to listen to him. But you've got to keep moving on. Because there are pickpockets around. Guard well thy pockets, for these sirens stand to aid the laborers of the diving hand. So these street singers are there, but they have accomplices. The accomplices are out in the crowd, and when you stop to listen to them, and you start dancing along with them, and you forget that some hand, and you don't feel a hand going in your pocket, you'll be out some money, more money than you throw in the hat for the singer. Who are these people who work together? Pickpockets and ballad singers. Confederate in the cheat, they draw the throng, and cambric handkerchiefs reward the song. They steal very, very valuable handkerchiefs. But soon as coach or cart drives rattling on the rabble, the rabble part, in shoals they backward run, uh, run. And so you begin to move the people out. And you have classical versions. There are Greeks and there are Trojans in the crowd. There are enemies and there are friends. And you have the classical illusion. Coachmen will push you aside. They'll run you down the street. They'll run down the streets and force you in the side of the building. Uh, go to line 155. Let not the chairman with assuming stride press near the wall and rudely thrust thy side. The laws have set him bounds. He's supposed to run only a certain part of the street. He's not supposed to run on the sidewalk. He's not supposed to interfere with pedestrians. And yet they do it. They should ne'er encroach where posts defend the street. And yet you see people moving into the policemen's lanes, and you see people moving over the white line, and you see people driving in frenetic fashion. You're going to see women selling oysters. Go to line 185. Be sure, observe, where brown Austria stands, who boasts her Shelley Ware from Wallfleet stands. Her Shelley Ware, she's selling shellfish, shell food, oysters. There mayest thou pass with safe, unmiry feet, where the raised pavement leads athwart the street. So the stores have pavement, 
they're allowed to stand, the, the people are allowed to put their stalls where they can sell the goods and it's a safe place to walk. Okay. The rain comes at line 205 and it's a thundering rain. When from high spouts the dashing torrents fall, ever be watchful to maintain the wall. Uh, English houses would have an overhang, and people would throw their slop from the overhang into the sewers. But if you walked under the overhang, you were safe. For shouldst thou quit thy ground, the rushing throng will with impetuous fury drive along. The water is going to push you, force you to move faster. If you move out of a dry spot, someone's going to rush in to take your place. All press to gain those honors thou hast lost, and rudely shove thee far without, outside the post. Line 216, you have people at the stop sign. Here we have them. Where three roads joined, he met his sire unknown. Unhappy sire, but more unhappy sire. He's talking about Oedipus. Remember Oedipus? Fleeing his home where he had heard the myth that he would kill his father. Actually comes to a crossroads where the king refuses to step aside and Oedipus kills the king. He doesn't know it's his father. Then he solves the problem of the sphinx and comes to his home where his mother without a husband and now is seeking to marry and marries Oedipus so he has killed his father and married his mother the Oedipal myth carries out in Greek tragedy here we have it in Gay's Trivia where he talks about the road, people joining at the road. Where three roads joined, he met his sire unknown, unhappy sire, but more unhappy son. Each claimed the way. Their swords, the strife decide, these people who want to walk or drive or move along this intersection, pull their swords. The hoary monarch fell. He groaned and died. That was Oedipus' father, was old, and he died. Hence sprung the fatal plague that thinned thy reign, thy cursed incest, and thy children slain. And here we again have the movement. Now we move into the funeral march. The funeral march. Contemplate mortal on thy fleeting years. Contemplate mortal on thy fleeting years. See with black train the funeral pomp appears. Now we're going to see a funeral march. And the paragraph is going to deal with life and death. And it ends with a final thesis summarizing this paragraph. How short is life? How frail is human trust? Is all this pomp for laying dust to dust? Is all this pomp for laying dust to dust? Do we live the kinds of lives we do? Do we look for power? Do we try to get m money only because, only to realize that in the end we return to dust? That becomes one of the central theses of this particular poem. Let's turn now to one other passage, and that's the passage where um, we meet the prostitute. Line 259. This becomes a three paragraph assertion. First we meet the prostitutes, then we see her plying her trade, then we see how she swindles the man. Each becomes a separate paragraph because each is a separate tale to tell and so you shift gears and you in interrupt the paragraph. Here we go. Oh, may thy virtue guard thee through the roads of Drury's mazy courts and dark abodes. Drury Lane is in the theater district. That's where the prostitutes would generally hang out. These are the harlots' guileful paths, 
who nightly stand where Catherine Street descends into the strand. Say, vagrant muse, their wiles and subtle arts to lure the stranger's unsuspecting heart. So shall our youth on healthful sinews tread and city cheeks grow warm with rural red. That is, people innocently coming into the countryside will be seduced by prostitutes or people coming from the country who are innocent and are lured into prostitution then serve the city streets. They come from both directions. Tis she... Here is his description of the prostitute. Tis she who nightly strolls with sauntering pace. No stubborn stays her yielding shape embrace. She, she's not wearing gir a girdle. She has to undress quickly. And consequently the poet is describing her loose appearance. <clears throat> Beneath the lamp her tawdry ribbons glare. The new scarred manteau and the slattern air. High draggled petticoats her travels show, and hollow cheeks with artful plush blushes glow. Now, how does she entice people to go with her? With flattering sounds, she soothes the credulous ear, the believing ear. Oh, my noble captain, charmer, love, my dear. Look at the rhyme, it's an incredible rhyme. With flattering sounds, she soothes the credulous ear. My noble captain, charmer, love, my dear. The poet is caught into it. And he takes her to, takes the man to her room. The poet says he remembers, I knew a yeoman who for thirst of gain to the great city drove from Devon's plain his numerous lowing herd. His herds he sold and his deep leathern pockets bagged with gold. Here's the herdsman who comes to the city, so sells his herd, has a lot of money in his pocket, drawn by the fraudful nymph. The nymph is a sweet young lady who governs nature, but this sweet young lady is fraudful. He gazed, he sighed, Unmindful of his home and his distant bride, he's now going to commit adultery. She leads the willing victim to his doom through winding alleys to her cobweb room. Run down motel on Old Spanish Trail. Thence through the streets he reels from post to post, valiant with wine, nor knows his treasure lost. She's, she's given him wine, he's drunk a lot, he leaves her and doesn't realize he doesn't have his money with him. The vagrant wretch the assembled watchman spies. He waves his hanger and their poles defy, defies. Now, he's arrested because he's drunk. He goes to jail. Deep in the roundhouse pent, all night he snores. And the next morn, in vain, his fate deplores. He realizes what he has lost. Well, the poet takes us a long way. And he does it in a way that is imitative of the Georgic verse. Virgil's Georgics deals with various occupations. And at the beginning of this class, you listed all the images of night you could imagine. Now what you have to do is transform it into poetic trope, write it in iambic pentameter, discover the essential rhymes, and produce a poem as good as John Gay's. Now let's look at another writer. This is Stephen Duck. Your book tells you, Stephen Duck lived from 1705 to 1756. Your book tells you that he was a laborer. At the age of 14, he was an agricultural laborer. 
He earned about 65 pounds or $100 a week in today's money. So he was doing pretty well. He taught himself to read Addison, Dryden, Milton, and Shakespeare. And at the age of 25, he had a wife and three children. Queen Caroline was so struck by the fact that an ignorant uh, farmer could know, write poetry well and could know the classics that she appointed him keeper of her library at Richmond. He was ordained a priest, but he became a victim of depression and apparently drowned himself in a trout stream. And that's the story of Stephen Duck. Duck. Now, Stephen Duck has written a poem on several subjects. He's written a book called Poems on Several Subjects. Your book tells you it was published in 1730 and ran 10 editions in a single year. Now, do you know what an edition is? An edition is not just a reprinting of a book. An edition is a separate typesetting of the book that was originally published. So that means 10 different printers reset his type and sold these books independently. Remarkable, remarkable work. Or it could have been his early printer who changed certain ideas, changed certain words in the type, but in fact set the type separately. So there's a lot of money invested in Stephen Duck's poetry. And to have the 10 editions in a single year would be incredible in the 20th century. It would be equally incredible in the 18th century. Stephen Duck talks about what his role is as a thresher. And he was actually a young man, a farmer, who worked for a master who made some money. The issue, of course, was how do you work on a farm and how do you make a living on a farm? It's just a fairly short poem compared to what we're looking at in terms of uh, John Gay. But in preparations for the thresher's labor, Stephen Duck says, Back to the barns again, in haste we're sent. Excuse me, that's... In haste we're sent, where lately so much time we pensive spent. So he used to spend time in the barn, and he uh, now has to go out in the field. And if you look at the poem, he talks about what it is to work in the field. We've got a lot of work to do, he says, line 223. Ye reapers, cast your eyes around the field and view the scene. Its different beauties yield. Well, if you work in the field, at first it's going to look very pretty. But after a while, it's going to look like nothing but work. Then look again with a more tender eye to think how soon it must in ruin lie. You're going to see the crops. You're going to harvest the crops. And then he describes how difficult it is to work. The morning passed, we sweat beneath the sun, and but uneasily our work goes on. Before us we perplexing thistles find, and corn blown adverse with ruffling wind. Behind our backs the female gleaners wait, who sometimes stoop and sometimes hold a chat. So here we are threshing, shearing the crops, but there's always, there are always crops left, and so the women come behind and pick up the gleanings. But they're very garrulous, so they're talking a lot. But everyone's working hard. He says, Each morn we early rise, go late to bed, and laboring hard, a painful life we lead. For toils, scarce ever ceasing, press us now. Rest never does. We never get rest. But on the Sabbath, show. Sometimes on the Sabbath we'll find ourselves with some rest. And barely that our master will allow. 
nor when we sleep are we secure from pain. We then perform our labors or again. So when you go to sleep, you should have rest. But if you dream of working in the fields, and if your bones are sore, and if your muscles are sore, then your sleep is going to be restless. So sleeping at night doesn't give you any respite from the labors of the day. Finally, they harvest the corn. At length, the rose stands up. At length, in rose stands up the well-dried corn, a grateful scene, and ready for the barn. Our well-pleased master views the sight with joy. This is the the owner of the farm knows he's going to make a lot of money. He's going to sell it for fuel to mix with gasoline. At length in rows stands up the well-dried corn, a grateful scene and ready for the barn. Our well-pleased master views the sight with joy. And we, for carrying, all our force employ. Now, he does go on to complain that while his master is going to make a lot of money, we don't. He says, the work is difficult. And finally, we get to the harvest. Confusion soon, or all the field appears, and stunning clamors fill the workmen's ears. The bells and clashing whips alternate sound, and rattling wagons thunder over the ground. All this is happening at the harvest time. The wheat got in, the peas and other grains share the same fate and soon leave bare the plain. And finally he concludes, this is not easy work. And he mentions the myth of Sisyphus. Remember Sisyphus was the titan who was punished by the gods and he had to roll a rock up a hill and as it reached the top, top of the hill it, it rolled back so his job was never done. Camus has written a book called The Myth of Sisyphus. Thus, as the year's revolving course goes round, no respite from our labor can be found. Like Sisyphus, our work is never done. Continually rolls back the rest is stun. Now growing labors still succeed the past, and growing always new must always last. We, we never can get over finishing this job because there's always more to be done afterwards. And then he complains that, well, the, war, the master, the owner of the farm makes a lot of money. He doesn't. Mary Collier, who, is a, who claims she was a washing woman, replies to Stephen Duck's poem. And uh, you have it on page 943, The Woman's Labor, an epistle to Mr. Stephen Duck in answer to his late poem called The Thresher's Labor by Mary Collier, now a washerwoman. Now, we don't know any more about Mary Collier than this poem and, by this, from, and then, then this introduction. We do know that she lived from 1740 to 1760, only 20 years. What does she talk about in this poem? First of all, she praises the poet. She writes an apostrophe to Stephen Duck. Then she celebrates his poetry. But her job is to honor women. Her job is to celebrate the role that women play in society. And so we have how women react in the evening who are work women, lines 75 to 87. And then what women do after the harvest, how they, what kinds of work, they have. their work is never done. After the harvest, they still have to cook, they still have to mend, they still have to sew, they still have to take care of the children, they still have to be with their husbands. What kind of work do they do in the morning? 
lines 168 to 187. And then they worry. It's not, it's not an easy life being a washerwoman. They worry over work. They worry over old age. They worry over poverty. They spend a great deal of time cleaning household pots. This is the dirty work. No one likes to clean pots. When I was in the army, I liked to clean pots when I was on KP because no one else wanted to do it. And the uh, uh, sergeant in the kitchen, who was hard on everyone, left me alone. As long as I was there cleaning these greasy pots, he didn't care what I did. And so I could think and sometimes read and figure out what I would write when I was out. But uh, uh, no one wanted the job of washing pots. That was on KP. Um, you can go a whole day and never talk to anyone washing pots. Where if you're delivering vegetables, you have to get them into the man and you have to cut them up and you can get all kinds of criticism from your chefs. Beer making. The women have to make beer. And then finally, she too has an ode to Sisyphus. She warns that there's so much work the women do that sometimes they think of murdering their husbands. And she reminds us of Danis's daughters who murdered their husbands at their father's request. She says, we, there's profit for owners, low pay for workers. We get that in... I th I probably misspoke. A uh, duck does not discuss the profits and the low pay. She does. I got that mixed up, and I was thinking of her when I mentioned that about him. But I don't think you'll find that in his poem. You'll find it in this poem. Let's look at what she says. She starts out by, by praising Stephen Duck. You know, poets compliment each other. Poets are sycophantic. They work with each other. We have poets on our campus who will be invited to other campuses to give lectures and teach poetry. And then their professors will be invited to come to our campus to read poetry. And it's all to advantage. They feed on each other. Immortal bard, thou favorite of the nine, Enriched by peers, advanced by Caroline. You see, she knows her history. She knows that Stephen Duck was honored as Queen Caroline's uh, librarian. That's how she opens the poem. You really got yourself a good deal. Deign to look down on one that's poor and low, remembering you yourself were surely so. One time you were poor like me. You were just a worker like me. Take your time and look at me for a few moments while I discuss my work and sympathize and empathize with what I do for a living. Accept these lines. Alas, what can you have from her who ever was and still is a slave? She's not happy with her lot. No learning was bestowed on me. My life was always spent in drudgery and not alone. Oft have I thought as on my bed I lay, eased from the tiresome labors of the day. But she says, I don't believe that women were for slavery designed. And yet here we are, washerwomen, slaves to the whims and machinations of those who control us and pay us and keep us in servitude. Karl Marx would have loved this poem, and Marxist scholars would print this poetry. Let's look at the scene where she describes her a, uh, farming. First, she has to work on the field. And she, too, goes out on the field. 
Look at line 75. What does she do at evening, and then what does she do the next day in the field? When evening does approach, we homeward hie, and our domestic toils incessant ply. We have these incessant tasks that we can never get over. Against your coming home, prepare to get our work all done, our house in order set. If everything's not ready, if your meal's not on the table, our husbands are going to be angry with us. They might even beat us. Bacon and dumpling in the pot we boil. Our beds we make. Our swine we feed the while. Then wait at door to see you coming home and set the table out against you coming. Early next morning we on you attend. Our children dress and feed. Their clothes we mend. And in the field our daily task we knew soon as the rising sun has dried the dew. So women's work is never done. From sun to sun. Even when they have babies, we must take them into the field and keep them with us because we can't leave them at home. There's no one to take care of them or feed them there. <clears throat> when night comes on, unto our home we go, our corn we carry, and our infants too. Weary, alas. But she says we can't complain about everything. We've just got to move on. Mary Collier goes on to discuss all the work. And doing the pots is really a big job. I'm going to read that because it's close to my heart. Line 203. She says, all we can look at us, all we can see ahead of us is old age and poverty. The washing is not all we have to do. We often change work for work as well as you. Our mistress of her pewter doth complain, and tis our part to make it clean again. So we've got a polysis pewter. This work, though very hard and tiresome too, is not the worst we hapless females do. We've got even harder work to do. What do we do? When night comes on and we quite weary are, we scarce can count what falls unto our share. Pots, kettles, saucepans, skillets we may see, skimmers and lady ladles, and such trumpery brought to make complete our slavery. Though early in the morning tis begun, tis often very late before we've done. Alas, our labors never know an end. On brass and iron we our strength must spend. So you have to feel sorry for Mary Collier. And that's why at the end of the poem, she suggests really that we get low pay, we work hard. Some days we just feel like killing our husbands. We pick up the newspaper and we find that uh, occasionally people do. Now the last writer we're going to look at is a rather remarkable work. It's a prose work by Elizabeth Fowler Haywood. Elizabeth Fowler Haywood lived from 1693 to 1756. So she lived after Pope. She lived after Swift. She, of course, was born later than both of them. At the age of 28, she left her husband of 10 years, who was a Norfolk minister. And she decided to support herself in London as a writer. She wrote some 60 publications, primarily prose fiction. She wrote plays. She wrote translations. And she was the author of a magazine called The Female Spectator. Now, the story she has written that we're going to look at today 
is called Phantomina or Love in a Maze, a masquerade novel by Eliza Haywood. Now the story is a very intriguing story. A young woman comes to London and she is fascinated at a play by the attention given prostitutes in the theater. She herself wants to attract men. She doesn't know quite how to do it, but she sees that these prostitutes get a lot of people coming to them. And so she dresses up like them and takes lodging not far from the theater where she thinks she can attract people. And she meets a man called Beau Plaisir. Beau Plaisir. A, woman, a man who's good looking and wants pleasure. She meets Beau Plaisir and he was in, taken by her and entranced by her. And he walks her back to this lodging that she has purchased near the theater. But she entices him. She entertains him. She gives him a meal. But she doesn't allow him any advances. And so he leaves quite taken aback with Phantomina, the woman whom he knows as Phantomina. The next time they meet, she is again determined not to admit him to, not to allow him to advance, not to admit him to any sexual joys or pleasure. But he starts talking to her and he gets very, very excited. And before she knows it, she has lost her virginity. And she realizes that as he gets out to leave, or gets up to leave, that she has given him all that she can possibly give him. And she has lost all that she could possibly possess. And she is determined that he will love her. But as happens with scoundrels, or happens with men in general, he is bored with her after a while. And he chooses not to date her anymore. She finds out that he is going into the countryside. And so she rushes ahead of him, disguises herself as a maid at an inn. And in the disguise of Celia, takes on a completely different attitude. Here she is, a maid at an inn. And maids at inns are notorious for sharing their wealth and their bodies with the inhabitants of the inn. Uh, Beau Plaisir finds her, likes her. She entertains him. She takes him to bed. He is excited about her. And they make love. And uh, after a while, he goes bored again. He doesn't choose to see her again. Upset with this, she changes into the clothing of a widow woman, rushes ahead of Beau Plaisir as he's leaving the inn, and in the guise of a widow woman who has just lost her husband, entices Beau Plaisir to take her along in safety. But Beau Plaisir realizes that in this widow woman who has lost her husband and seems so sad, there is a quiet, silent urge to continue lovemaking. And so as the widow bloomer she again entertains Beau Plaisir. Now you may be asking yourself a very logical question. Why doesn't he recognize her? Well she explains it in the story. She says that she was so clever and so good at disguises 
and so expert at changing accents, and, and so, so very uh, uh, skilled at costuming, that at one point she would have her hair long, but as the widow bloomer, she would have it in a bun. That Beau Plaisir never recognized her. Now, you have to accept that. She explains it. I mean, if you pick up the newspapers and wonder why government officials do what they do, they explain it. They said, we didn't do it, we did do it. You have to believe them, right? Even though you know they're lying. But she seems to have pulled off this fanciful deal. Until her mother comes to town. And her mother has heard rumors that her daughter has been loose and lascivious. And her mother wants to know what happened. Well... Her mother doesn't have to wait long to find out what happened because Fantomina, Celia, the widow bloomer, has become pregnant. And now this baby is growing. At first she tightens the baby. At first she puts on corsets. At first she tries to prevent people from knowing that this baby exists. But finally she is in great pain and about to deliver her family thinks that she is suffering an illness, an inexplicable illness. The doctor is brought to help her, and the doctor discovers the illness is not at all inexplicable. And consequently, this lady who has given up all, who has delivered an illegitimate child, who has lost her reputation, whom Beau Plaisir has refused to recognize, he refuses to recognize her as Fantomina, he refuses to recognize her as Celia, and he refuses to recognize her as the Widow Bloomer. Blow Plaisir leaves. And she moves to a monastic life. She is a friend, the family is a friend, in a, monastery, in a convent, and the woman moves there. And this is Eliza Fowler Haywood's story. What, what she, that she calls a masquerade novel. It's a novel about events that occur to a woman who has decided to risk all for the love of a man whom she is obsessed about and who, like so many men, is a, uh, satisfied only by sex and disinterested once he has won the reward. Well, I want to read a few passages from this because it's a style, this, this absolutely particular, particularized, exacting style that makes us believe the story. There is so much detail and so much involvement, so much intrigue, so much costuming, so much masquerading that you have to assume that this is really an ingenious writer speaking about women at night and how to satisfy the whims of the men whom they desire or entice. The writing, of course, requires a certain discipline. You must be determined to read it. And you cannot uh, uh, read it easily while watching television or watching March Madness it, uh, in fact, if you're watching a basketball game that really entices you and really get involved in the story, you'll, you'll be hard-pressed to learn the score of the game at the end because you'll be so much involved in what Eliza, Eliza Haywood has to say. Um... Turn to page 793. Here is where she is dressing as the uh, widow bloomer. Bottom of 793. 
Pardon me. At the bottom of the page, it begins, it would not be very easy to represent the surprise. You have that? It would not be very easy to represent the surprise so odd an address created in the mind of him to whom it was made. She had not the appearance of one who wanted charity. And what other favor she required, he could not conceive. That's Beauplaisir. But telling her she might command anything in his power gave her encouragement to declare herself in this manner. You may judge, resumed she, by the melancholy garb I am in, that I have lately lost all that ought to be valuable to womankind. But it is impossible for you to guess the greatness of my misfortune. Unless you had known my husband, who was master of every perfection, to endear him to a wife's affections. But notwithstanding, I look on myself as the most unhappy of my sex in outliving him. I wish he had died, I died first. Now I'm without him, and I'm lonesome. I must so far obey the dictates of my discretion as to take care of the little fortune he left behind him which being in the hands of a brother of his in London, will be all carried off to Holland, where he is going to settle. If I reach not the town before he leaves, I am undone forever. So she gives him this line. I've got to get to London. I have no way to get there. I've got to get my money. The family is going to steal it. Page 608. To which end, she says, I left Bristol, the place where we lived, hoping to get a place in the stage at Bath. But they were all taken up before I came. She couldn't get on the stagecoach. And being by a hurt I got in a fall, rendered incapable of traveling any long journey on horseback, I have no way to go to London. And so Beau Plaisir is going to take her. She says, here, this is Haywood talking, here the feigned widow ended her sorrowful tale, which had been several times interrupted by a parenthesis of sighs and groans by Beauplaisir with a complacent and tender air. Now, if you go to the bottom of the page, we see what's happening. And this, of course, is Haywood describing how Miss, the widow Bloomer, is, who was Celia, who was Fantamina, is going to get to Beauplaisir. So she becomes herself a seducer. It says this. By her gestures, blow Beau Plaisir, without being as stupid as he was really the contrary, could not avoid perceiving there were seeds of fire not yet extinguished in this fair widow's soul, which wanted but the kindling of breath of tender sighs to light the blaze. Now, this of course is what the widow Blomer is hoping for. And she, of course, is going to satisfy Beau Plaisir, but again, he is going to lose interest in her. Now, I want to quickly mention the paragraph that follows about two paragraphs later, in which she describes how she was able to pull out all these disguises. She says she could vary her very glad. Listen to this, because it really describes, remember, Haywood is also a playwright. And so she understands the way an actress works. She could vary her very glances, tune her voice to accents the most different imaginable from those which she spoke when she appeared herself. These aids from nature joined to the wiles of art. And the distance between the places where the imagined Fantamina and Celia were might very well prevent 
his having any thought that they were the same or that the fair widow was either of them. Now the story plays in a lot of different directions. And it's an amazing story and a very impressive story by an important writer. Well, go back to your rooms, go back to your apartments, go back to your houses, and see if you can write poems about the night, poems about the work, or poems about your loves that equate what you've heard today. Thank you.